All right, all right, let me uh, set these aside. Now, the other day, um, we looked at a, at, a, at a list of scripture, and, and I said, these you can check in modern versions uh, to see what is wrong with them. And you saw, you saw some grave doctrinal changes, did you not? Now, I'm going to say this again because as much as I don't like new versions, nothing fries me like a Bible believer who argues their case. And some of these guys, they'll say this, well, I can still find the doctrine, or I can still or find some doctrines in my modern translation. Yeah, but you saw it was messed up. But here's what I tell people. This book, the Bible, is not a doctrinal textbook. We get our doctrine from it, do we not? Let me ask you, let me ask you, uh, you ever call a friend, say, hey, hey, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're just going to uh, you know, go have a picnic tonight. You want to come with us? Well, no, I think I'm going to stay home and read my college textbook. Now, that is somebody that needs to get a life, isn't it? I mean, who says, I want to read my college textbook? That's not what this book is. This is the word and the words, plural, of God. What we're going to look at tonight is we're going to look at some verses, some other verses that are not doctrine. Because here's what I say, and, and I will prove this night, the, the modern translations make problems where there were no problems before. It's not that they just go and attack the sonship of Jesus Christ, as you saw. It's not that they attack, they steal Calvary right out of the Bible. Uh, it's not that they do those things. It is that there are verses that you would read and go, wow, there's, there's absolutely nothing doctrine about this verse. Uh, why would anybody change it? Guys, you know, I don't say that every person that translates a modern version is demon-possessed. I don't say that they're all gone to hell. But think about this. If this book really is the perfect word of God, number one, we know then that God is not in the room where they're translating a modern translation. Secondly, if this is the word of God, remember I told you the easiest job in the world is to change one word of this, and you have now made perfect imperfect? So if God is not in the room, there is another spirit in that room. And you're going to see some stuff here, and you're going to, get, you're going to be appalled. You really will. You're going to go, I don't believe that. And here's what I say. Whenever I teach this, this is all I keep saying is, don't worry. It gets worse. It really does. And so what we're going to do, I've, I've asked the pastor to get me nine, uh, nine guys. I'm going to call on those guys now. Guys, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, when you come up, bring your Bible. Set them back there because you won't need them. Uh, you won't need your Bible until, until we're done, but you'll want it then. So, so bring your Bible with you. Uh, I am going to read a passage from the Bible or a verse, and then I will, I will instruct the guys to read them. And, um, and guys, you're not, uh, you're not auditioning for your, your, your monologue for the Tonight Show. <laughs> I, I did have to explain that to a guy once. But... Um, uh, we will read these. So, so the guys that were asked to come and read, if you'll come up now. I, you know, somebody said, uh, why don't you get guys yourself? I said, well, preacher knows. But um, I actually said, I need guys to come up and read Bibles for me. And this guy came up. And when I, when I called on him, he goes, he didn't say anything. I said, it's your turn to read. I can't read. I said, then why did you come up? And so we buried him in the backyard. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Let's see. We, we're going to need to get you a line of breast, side, shoulder to shoulder. So it's kind of step out that way a little bit. All right. Um, now, we have nine modern translations here. There's the good news for modern man. Same one you read at home. <laughs> Living Bible. You can set this down if you want, brother, because you'll need it to, uh, you'll need your hands to. This is the Amplified. Now, the Amplified is the funniest version out there. Because if you know anything about translating, when you translate like a Greek word, you're going to translate this Greek word, it might have five different ways it'll be translated, and you've got to pick. The guys that translated the Amplified were horribly uh, uh, insecure. So where modern translation said, we'll pick this one, we'll pick this one, they went, let's put all five. And so they would go, you know, in fact, what, you see what he's got? That's just the book of John. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, 
But it is. They, they just, they just they, you know, like if one, say, one guy says large, one guy says big, one guy says humongous, one guy says immense, the Amplified says the big, large, humongous. Yeah, yeah, they just said, say it all. This is the good news for modern man. No, no, no. This is the, I'm sorry, New World Translation. This is the Jehovah Witness Bible. And I know what you just said. Well, preacher, you don't ever have to worry about us using that. If you've got a modern translation, you may already be using that. This is the New English Bible. Now, I want you to notice this. Here's where it, This says TEV. That stands for Today's English Version. That is actually the official name of the Good News for Modern Man. You may know it as the Good News for Modern Man, but its official name is Today's English Version. Today's English Version, the Living Bible, the Amplified, the New World, and, and the uh, New English. And you'll notice the, the line here is very prominent because you get people that will say this. They'll say, Oh, you don't want one of those liberal modern translations. You need to get a conservative modern translation. Okay, when we cross this line, there's no doubt that the New King James, New American Standard, NIV, and the ESV, English Standard, are, are conservative translations. You have the New King James. You have the Porcelain Wonder, the American Standard. <laughs> you have the New International. And Kevin, could you get completely out of sight? It would help us all. Good. That's great. <laughs> And, uh, and Kevin has English Standard. Now, uh, here's what I'll do, guys. I will call for the reference. I will, we'll start right there. First name, brother, what's your name? Dan. Dan. We'll start there, and I'll call on you to read them, uh, and you can, uh, you can read what they, uh, what they did uh, in these modern translations. First, guys, uh, go to 1 Samuel chapter 13. First Samuel chapter 13. I have markers here somewhere. Are they behind you? Markers, markers. Oh, there, no, 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 I had a, I had a, a this is what I do. Well, Just proves you can't leave nothing laying around. Oh, no, no, no. All right, I'll just use what we got here. I'll find him as soon as we're done. All right, go to 1 Samuel. Thirteen. You're a wonderful guy, Chris, I'm telling you. I don't know why they say those things about you around here because I don't think any of them are true. I, I, I want to tell you, two things. Let me, let me give you two sidebars. Number one, I think your church staff is great. Uh, I was telling my wife that, you know. I said, other than the pastor and Chris and, and the other guys, uh, they're all good. But, um, no, really, you do have a tremendous staff. Let me say something else. I've wanted to say this, and I've forgotten. Your pastor's been mentioning your bus ministry. Um, I, I am one of those people that I was, I know it was I not for the bus ministry. I was hostile against the bus ministry. Uh, bribing kids with candy, padding your numbers, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you what changed me. Um, I'm, I'm in this church, and uh, they had a, they had a, special, <clears throat> a special service, <clears throat> and they had their bus kids get up and sing. And these bus kids, I can still remember this day, there's 104 of them, and they sang the B-I-B-L-E, and they sang Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, and they are there with their D- dirty T-shirts, and, and literally they were, their faces were dirty, and as these kids are singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, um, a couple of thoughts came to me. Number one, remember, ladies, remember I said that before there were public schools and private schools and everything else, where were children taught? On their mother's lap. And as I'm hearing these kids uh, sing the B-I-B-L-E and Jesus loves me, I thought, you know something, Lord? Kids used to learn these songs on their mother's knee. And some of the kids that learned those songs on their mother's knee, turned 18, 19, got out of church, got into the world, uh, and they said, uh, you know what? I'm going to kill myself because nobody loves me. And then they went, wait a minute. Jesus loves me. This I know. How do I know that? My mom taught me that song. And I'm looking at these 104 kids, and I thought, they are not learning these on their mother's knee. You understand? We've got a whole... Several generations that are no longer getting the Bible. They're not getting it at school. They're not getting it at home. And I said, Lord, some of these kids right here, they're going to turn 18 or 19. They're going to get out of church. 
and, and they're going to get into that world, and one of them days they're going to put a gun to their head, and they're going to say, I'm going to kill myself because nobody loves me. They go, wait a minute. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. I learned that because of a church bus. Now that's the value of your bus ministry. That and Bill Adams. So who's Bill Adams? He's pastor of Smyrna Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. Bus kid. You might not like bus ministries. He's kind of prejudiced in favor of them. All right, so if you're smart, think about this, guys. Uh, if you would invest in that gasoline, maybe you ought to adopt a bus and just say, I'm going to make sure this one is, is, is mine. Um, you might have part of a ministry that some pastor that comes off your bus ministry ends up pastoring a church. So you, I, I just want to say that um, because it, it blesses me. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Now, first off, I really don't think that anybody here uh, ever said, when you got to 1 Samuel chapter 13, boy, that's a controversial verse. Look what it says. Saul reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel. Now, does anybody have trouble figuring out how long Saul has been the king by the end of that verse? Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. That's a very simple verse. That's not a doctrinal verse. That's not the deity of Christ. That is just a very simple verse that tells you, by the end of the verse, he's been reigning for two years. Okay, Dan, well, what does the good news from modern man have, verse 1? 1 Samuel 13, verse Yeah. One. Saul picked 3,000 men. That's verse 2. There is no verse 1. No verse 1. It's been omitted. I guess they just couldn't take the heat. You know, that tough doctrinal stuff. I mean, can you believe it? They, I guess that's good news from modern man. Uh, the Living Bible. By this time, Saul had reigned for one year. In the second year of his reign, he okay. selected. That's it. Very good. The, the, the Living Bible, which is known as a uh, liberal translation, has it right. Does it not? Uh, the Amplified. Amplified, Caleb. Saul was 40 years old when he had begun to reign, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. Now you say, somebody ought to be saying, where did that 40 come from? Wait till I tell you. We're not done yet. What did I tell you? It gets worse. Um, New World Translation. Saul was, question mark, years old when he began to reign, and for two years he reigned over Israel. Okay, so they wouldn't touch his age. Um, New English. Saul was 50 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel for 22 years. All right, now we're going to cross into the conservative side, so it should be pretty safe. New King James. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. Okay, New King James has it right. New American Standard. Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 32 years over Israel. NIV. Saul was 30 years old when he became king. And he reigned over Israel 42 years. What's ESV got, Kev? Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel. Okay. All right. The ESV's got it right. Now, now here's the thing, guys. That verse is, that verse has never been considered controversial. And yet you've got these guys omitted. These guys say he was 40 years old in brackets. This one won't say how what his age was, but here's the three that I really like. This one said he was 30 years old and reigned 42 years. This one said he was 40 years old and reigned 32 years. This one reigned, said he was 50 years old and reigned 22 years. Now, you know some folks don't get it. I actually pointed this out, and this lady, sorry ladies, but this lady came up after church and she says, I don't understand the problem. They all three add up to 72. But now, here's what I told you. I told you the other day. They tell you, you need a new translation because your King James Bible has mistakes in it. Isn't it obvious that the translators of the NIV thought the New American Standard had a mistake? You will never hear a modern translation come out and be critical of another modern translation because they work together. And because they don't care about accuracy in translation, it's not about money, people. It's about getting rid of that book, the King James Bible. 
Bookstores will steer you into a modern translation. You say, because they're making more money. They make 40% on every book they sell. They don't make 41 on a modern translation. They make 40%. They don't make 39% on a King James. They make 40%. They make the same money on a King James that they do on an NIV. It's not about money. It's about getting rid of the pure word of God. And so you got, you got 30 years old, reign 42 years, 40 years old, reign 32 years, and 50 years old, and reign 22 years. But here's the real problem. Remember I told you last night some of your lost friends hate there's contradictions in the Bible? Um, who's got the NIV? You do? Uh, go to Acts chapter 13. I'm, you get the New American Standard? Yeah, you can go to Acts 13. And New English? You can go to Acts 13. All right, uh, NIV, would you read... Acts chapter 13, verse 21. Now, let me explain. Acts chapter 13, verse 21 is the Apostle Paul giving a little history of Israel. And watch what happens. Go ahead. Uh, then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, the son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. 40 years. All right. Then you know what you got in, in the Ameri New, New International Version? You've got a Bible with a, with a contradiction. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, it said he reigned 42 years. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 21, it says he reigned 40 years. Now, don't say, well, they're so close. Really? Uh, I would like you to give me, well, I'll, I'll show you exactly what I'll tell you what I'm going to show you in, in a second. New American Standard. And they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the, tri uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. 40 years. There's a big gap between 32 and 40, isn't there? Um, New, New English. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. So in one place it says he reigned 22 years, and the other place it said he reigned 40 years. You know what we call that? We call that contradiction. And I've always said I, w I would like to run into a translator of the New English version and say, uh, could I borrow $22? That's four tens. <clears throat> All right, the, uh, the next one, guys, is uh, Numbers chapter 21. Oh, yeah, there's a hot chapter. Numbers 21. And we're going to be reading, uh, actually, verses 14 and 15. It'd take quite a musician, a uh, magician, to, uh, to make an entire sea disappear, don't you think? Because I want you to know that most modern translators are magicians because the Red Sea is about to disappear, the entire Red Sea. Uh, look at verse 14. Wherefore, it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord what he did uh, in the Red Sea and in, and in the brooks of Arnon and at the streams of the brooks that goeth down to the dwelling of Ar and lieth upon the border of Moab. Now, the reason I have to read 14 and 15 is because they're just funny. I mean, they get, uh, I think it's American Standard, gets really wild. Uh, Dan. That is why the book of the Lord's battle speaks of the town of Wahab in the area of Supa and the valleys, the Arnon River, and the slope of the valleys that extend to the town of Ar and toward the border of Moab. Now, you lost the Red Sea, yeah. right? Problem is, nobody can find it. Um, how about the Living Bible? This fact is mentioned in the book of the Wars of Jehovah, where it is stated that the va valley of the Aaron River and the city of Waheb lie between the Amorites and the people of Moab. All right, no Red Sea there. Amplified? That is why it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Waheb and Supa and the valleys of the branches of the Arnon River and the slope of the valleys that stretch toward the site of Ar and find support on the border of Moab. Okay, new uh, world. That is why it is said in the book of the wars of Jehovah, Waheb and Supa and the torrent valleys of Arnon and the mouth of the torrent valleys which has bent itself toward the seat of Ar and has leaned against the border of Moab. Now check, does it say W or a V? Does it start? Waheb or Vaheb? Vaheb. Okay. Uh, New English? 
That is why the book of the wars of the Lord speaks of the Heb and Sufa and the gorges, Arnon and the watershed of the gorges that falls away towards the dwellings that are and slopes towards the frontier of Moab. Okay, now we lost the Red Sea. You got Waheb, 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 Vaheb, Vaheb. I'll give it, we'll give you why, why on that in a little while. Uh, New King James. Therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Waheb and Sufa, the book the brooks of the Anon and the slope of the brooks that reaches to the dwelling of Ar and lies on the border of Moab. Well, the conservatives didn't do any better, did they? Uh, New American Standard? Therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, uh, Waheb and uh, Sufa uh, and the widest of Arnon, the slopes of the widest and the extents of the site of Ar and leans to the border of Moab. Yeah, great. I feel enlightened. Uh, New International? That is why the book of the wars of the Lord says, We have in Sephora, in the ravines of, of the Aaron, yeah, and the slopes of the ravines the, uh, that led to the site of Arm and lie along the border of Moab. Okay, and uh, English Standard, Kevin? Therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, We have in Sufhaf, in the valley of Arnon, and the slopes of the valley that extend to the seat of Ar and leans to the border of Moab. Now, you saw that every modern translation there misplaced the Red Sea. But the thing that puzzled me is I got Wahib, 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 Vahib, Vahib, Wahib, 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 Wahib. And I thought, why did these guys use W's and these guys use V's? And I ran into a translator of the New English Version, and I said, uh, why did everybody else translate Wahib, and you guys said Vahib? And he said, well, I'll tell you why we did that. I said, uh, never, never mind. <laughs> never mind. I don't think I need any help. All right. Uh, gentlemen, go to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, we're going to be looking at verse 5. Now, there are just, um, they're just figments of speech, the way they talk. And one of the things that the, uh, one of the, things that the Jews would say, uh, you can backtrack, look at chapter 13 for a second, look at verse 15. It says, the Lord then answered him and said, uh, thou hypocrite, dost not each of you uh, on the Sabbath day lead his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Uh, and it was a, a Jewish colloquialism to just say, your ox and ass, talking about the, the, the ox and the, and the uh, donkey. Uh, chapter 14, look at verse 5. And he answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ox or an ass fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? Now, that doesn't sound like a doctrinal verse. You'd think that one was safe, wouldn't you? Let's find out. Good news for modern man. Then he said to them, if any of you had a son or an ox that happened to fall in a well on a Sabbath, would you not pull him out at once on the Sabbath itself? An ox or an ass? <laughs> you know, I wonder, I wonder what the family relationship was like for some of these modern translators. Living. Then he turned to them, which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? He asked, if your cow falls into a pit, don't you proceed at once to get it out? Okay, okay, cow. Does anybody here know the difference between an ox and a cow? Don't stand up and describe anything. I'm just, you know. But I'm sure hoping those guys find out before it's time for milking. <laughs> Amplify. And he said to them, which of you? having a son or a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a well will not at once pull him out on the Sabbath day? See, I told you. They got to get everybody in. They got the whole zoo. <laughs> New World Translation. And he said to them, Who of you, if his son or bull falls into a well, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Okay. You went from ass and ox to son and bull. I'm still not sure what these guys are smoking. Okay. <laughs> New English Bible. 
Then he turned to them and said, If one of you has a donkey or an ox and it falls into a well, will he hesitate to haul it up on the Sabbath day? Okay, donkey or ox. Basically, that's correct. They, you know, Bible says ass, jackass, but it's an ox or, or it's a donkey. Uh, New King James. Then he answered them saying, Which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Okay, New King James got it right. New American Standard. And he said to them, Which one of you shall have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? Apparently conservatives have as many family problems as Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> uh, New International. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? Uh, ESV. And he said unto them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? Now, guys, these are the conservatives. And that's what they want. They'll, they'll, people will say... Don't use these modern translations, these liberal translations. Get a conservative one. The, the English Standard Version is one of the hottest ones there is out there, and it reads just like the liberal ones. Maybe it's not um, l modern liberal translation versus modern conservative translation. Maybe the problem is modern translation. Uh, take a look at this. Now, this one is, it is doctrinal, but, uh, but I want you to see it. Go to um, Luke chapter 16. <coughs> Luke chapter 16, and I told you that the Bible is not just our textbook, but the Bible is really the, it is our authority by which we preach, is it not? Amen. I mean, when we say salvation is by grace, you better be able to show it from the Bible. If you say, without Christ you're going to die and go to hell, you better be able to show it from the Bible. Isn't that true? All right, in Luke chapter 16... <clears throat> Verse 22, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by, this, this is Lazarus, uh, you know, and the rich man and Lazarus, uh, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eye, eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. All right, we're going to look, guys, at the word, third word into uh, uh, verse 23, and in, and tell me what you got for verse 23. Where did the rich man find himself? Hades. He found himself in Hades, not hell. Uh, Living Bible. Uh, hell. Hell. Now you say, well, see, the Living Bible has it right. No, Living Bible had it right. Remember, I, remember we read two New King James versions the other day? Well, I got news for you. There's two Living Bibles. And the one that, that he's reading out of is an old Living Bible and the new one has taken out hell and just says the place of the dead. So they all went to seminary. <laughs> Amplified version. Hades. Hades. New World Translation. Hades. You better believe they're going to have Hades. They don't believe in hell. Apparently neither is the Amplified Version or... The Good News for Modern Man. Uh, New World Translation. Hades. Hades. All right, now let's get to the conservatives. New King James. Hades. Hades. Guys, there's no hell in a New King James Version. That is not the King James without the these and thous. That is the King James without the Word of God. Yeah. And without hell. Um, New American Standard. Hades. New International. Hell. Hell. You say the New International has it right? Not anymore. No, not anymore. That's a 1973 edition. The new edition says Hades. Um, new English, or English Standard. Hades. Hades. Now, do you see that out of anything but a King James Bible, no preacher can preach on hell? You cannot preach on the destiny of a lost person. Well, you know, that's such an awful place. You better believe it's an awful place. Why wouldn't you want to warn somebody about it? Why would you change the entire world or the entire word of God 
uh, so that you didn't have to confront the fact that people are going to hell. Um, we saw this the other day. I just want you to see how they do it. Uh, go back to Luke 23, guys. And we talked about Calvary. And so in Luke chapter 23... In verse 33, it says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. All right, guys, what I basically just tell me what word they have for Calvary in the Good News Mother Man. Skull. Skull. Uh, Living Bible? Skull. 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 Uh, New English? Skull. New King James? Calvary. Calvary. New American Standard? Uh, I don't have chapter 23. Oh, that's right. That's right. (laughs) I'm sorry. Um, That one was abused one time. But I can, I can just, you just have to believe me at Skull or go buy a New American Standard and prove me wrong. Uh, New International? Uh, I don't know what verse it is. Pardon me? What, what verse? Uh, 23, 23, chapter 23, verse 33. Okay. They came to the place which Skull. Is, skull. English Standard. Skull. Now, guys. Let me ask you this is a real simple question. Do you love Calvary? Amen. I mean, do we not really sing about Calvary? Yeah. You have just lost your authority to sing about Calvary. You say, well, if I got a new King James, I can. Yeah. And you got messed up in some other places with no hell. Yeah. Just because you can find one place where it's good doesn't mean it's good anyplace else. Yeah. But, but in every modern translation, except the new King James, every modern translation, including the conservative ones, skull, no Calvary. You say, could it get worse? Absolutely. I'll tell you how bad it can get. I'm going to give you a Greek lesson. Uh, Go to Acts chapter 26. Now, remember, guys, I told you that if I ask you a question, uh, I'm not setting you up, that, that the question, the answer will probably be obvious. You're going to have to guess at this answer, but I'm going to give you a Greek word. And, and all right, like, like if I were to give you the Greek word for evil, I mean diabolically, horribly evil. I think it's the Greek word, uh, democrato. <laughs> but um, I'm going to give you a Greek word, and somebody just wing it. Make a wild guess on what you think this word means in, in, in Greek. The word I want to talk to you about is a word called Hebros. H, it'd be like H-E-B-R-O-S. Hebros. So I'm going to guess what that's a word word for. Somebody said it. What what was it? Hebrew. Hebrew. That's it. If you want to say Hebrew and Greek, you say Hebros. So is that really hard to figure out? I mean, you wouldn't have to be a great scholar to know Hebros means Hebrew, Correct. (laughs) <laughs> Let's find out. Um, good news. What do they have there? In Acts chapter 26, verse 14, uh, that's where the Apostle Paul is before Agrippa. Mm-hmm. We looked at this uh, the other day. Verse 14, he says, And when we are fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue. All right, I want you to know that the word translated Hebrew in that verse is the Greek word Hebrew. Hebrews, all right? Okay, Dan. Hebrew. Hebrew. Well, they got it right. I don't know how they could get it wrong personally, but... Okay, Living Bible, what does it say? Hebrew. Hebrew. Amplified? Hebrew. Hebrew. You say, Gip, they're getting it right. Yep, sure are. All those liberals, all those wicked, rotten liberals... 
know how to translate Hebrews as Hebrew, correct? Right? Okay. New World. Hebrew. Oh, even the Jehovah Witnesses know how to translate it. New English. Jewish. Jewish. All right. That's kind of a hedge. First off, it's not the word for Jewish. It's the word for Hebrew. And you could say Yiddish. People would say, well, the Jews speak Yiddish. That might be what it is. Well, yeah, it's not as clear. But you got Hebrew, 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 Hebrew. And somehow these guys came up with uh, uh, Jewish. New King James. Hebrew. Hebrew. You say, well, preacher, I don't see a problem here. That's because we're not done yet. New American Standard. Hebrew. Hebrew. All oh, the conservatives are doing good. New International. Aramaic. Aramaic. They translated Aramaic. I heard speaking in an Aramaic tongue. Guys, the word Hebros is not the Greek word for Aramaic. It's the Greek word for Hebrew. So how could anybody do that? I wanna, I'll, I'll ask you one. How could anybody say there's mistakes in the King James Bible and the bonehead that did this thinks he's going to do a better job than the King James translators? He couldn't do a better job than the Jehovah Witnesses. What's the uh, English standard say? Hebrew. Hebrew. Now you say, preacher, why does that say Aramaic? I'm going to tell you why. You know, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 18, the Lord says, Thou art Peter upon this rock, I'll build my church. He says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter is not the rock. The Lord Jesus Christ is the rock. That's right. And in Greek... The word for Peter and rock are two different words. But in Aramaic, they are the same, Cephas. So that is why the Roman Catholic Church teaches a lie that Jesus and his apostles and everybody around there spoke Aramaic, not Hebrew, not Greek. That way they can have him saying, Thou art Peter, and upon Peter I will build my church. And the New International Version backs up the Roman Catholic Church. Get this. Every time, New International, you got it? Go to Philippians chapter 3. You guys don't have to. He's just going to get his. Um, every single time when the Hebrew language is mentioned in the New International Version. Now get this. How could anybody see Hebrews and say, oh, that's Aramaic? You say, well, that's what they thought. Well, the Bible isn't time for your opinion, bucko. Right? So every time the word Hebrew shows up in reference to language, they say Aramaic. Let me read you something from Philippians chapter 3. This is the Apostle Paul talking. And he says this. He's kind of given his pedigree. And he says this in verse 5. See, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. What's your name, brother? Dominic. Dominic. Read uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regarding to the law. In the NIV, when he said, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews... The NIV translators translated it. Well, they knew they couldn't translate it. I'm an Aramaic of the Aramaics. That proves they knew how to translate it. That proves they could correctly translate it every time. Uh, the contemporary English version, CEV, also says Aramaic. So the NIV is, is uh, trying to get points with the Roman Catholic Church. But, 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 didn't I take and get worse? Uh, go to 2 Timothy, guys. Second Timothy, chapter 3. Now, I don't know if you know this. Um, I, I would really like a dollar for every time somebody dated the rapture. Wouldn't you? I bet your house would be paid for in fact, you'd have a lot nicer house, and it would be paid for. Uh, but, but no matter what you think about the Lord coming back, you, wouldn't you, can we now all agree on this? I mean, you know, everybody says, he, I've, heard, I've got a friend. Every January 1st, he says, 
He's coming this year for sure. He has said that for 45 years. Nope, he's coming this year for sure. You know, I gotta, I tell you this, I believe the Lord could come anytime, but we have used a very good thing, the rapture, for an excuse, excuse to do a very bad thing. No thing. We don't plan anything. Well, why would you go do something that's going to, why would you have a five or ten year plan for your church preacher? We're going to be out of here next year. And so nobody ever, we never go into the future, look into the future or plan anything for the future because we might be out of here. And guys, you understand that most people that thought the Lord's coming back in their, in their lifetime are dead right now? So no matter what you think about the rapture, wouldn't you, couldn't we agree on this? We got to be in the last days. Sure. Okay. Didn't I say that this book, the Bible, is our, talk about as preachers, it is our power to preach to you. Is it not? Look what it says, 2 Timothy chapter 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. All right, we, well, wouldn't you say we're in perilous times? I mean, the North Korean's about to get a nuclear missile that can hop, hop over here. And uh, the last, that was because of Bill Clinton and because of uh, Barack Obama. Iran will have one soon. And this is perilous times. You can be walking down a street and somebody just drive up over top of you on a car yelling, Al Akbar. We are in perilous times because this is the last days. For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Do you know what, do you know what without natural affection is? That's men marrying men. That's women marrying women. That is people that are more worried about whales than babies. That is, that's tree huggers. I know you guys, you probably wouldn't do this. I do this. I carry a spare lock in my truck. I have, out in that GMC, I got a, I got a lock. I live for the day. I see a couple of tree huggers chained to a tree. Because I just want to help. I just want to walk up there and snap that lock in there and leave. And I, can you see him? Okay, Bill, uh, the cameras are leaving. Uh, I, I unlocked my lock. Uh, now unlock your lock. I didn't put a lock on there. Take the other lock off. That ain't my lock. I only had one lock on there. Isn't that your lock? No, that's not my lock. Help, we're chained to a tree. Anyway. <laughs> So, because of the book on this pulpit, your pastor can get up and preach against homosexuality. He can preach against incest. He can preach against some of the perverted things that are going on in our country. He can preach against uh, the environmental movement and the animal rights movement, which are all unnatural affection. By the way, I told you, I don't go to Greek for authority, but I go there because I know somebody's going to go there. And the word translated unnatural, uh, unnatural affection it can be translated one way, unnatural affection. There's not a second choice. You got that word? It's got to be unnatural affection or without natural affection. Let's see how these guys did. Uh, good news, modern man, Dan. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, just the beginning of it, what's it say? They will be unkind. Oh, unkind. Now, here's the problem. First off, the gun that was aimed at the perverts has been unloaded, right? But did you see what they did? Didn't they just turn around on us? Well, you people that are telling people are going to hell, that's very unkind. I mean, they not only took away the power to preach, but they turned it on the very people that used the Bible to preach. Uh, living Bible. They will be hard-headed. Hard-headed. Oh, you think... You think there haven't been some preachers that talked about this church and said, no, nah, I, I like Brother Danzel, but you know, he's a little hard-headed over this King James thing. Again, the perverts escaped. They can't be preached against. And, the, and you hard-headed Baptists that won't, you just, you know what your problem is? You're so narrow-minded and hard-headed and you just won't give a little grace about eternal security or speaking in tongues or uh, boozing it up on a weekend. You're just too hard-headed. And so now, not only can we not preach against people that ought to be preached against, but they can use the very verse that we would have used against them against us. That is demoniac. Um, amplify. They will be without natural human affection. Without 
natural affection. Well, they got it right. Wouldn't you say? They got it right. Amplified. New World Translation. Having no natural affection. No natural affection. All right? The Jehovah's Witnesses got it right. You know, this is the bad crowd. Uh, let's see. Uh, New English. No natural affection. No natural affection. Well, one thing, if the, if the liberals can get it straight, I guess we don't have to worry about the conservatives. They should have it okay. How about good news from our... Or no, 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 no. New King James. Unloving. Oh. That's what your problem is. You bunch of King James rabid people. You're just unloving. And you're unkind. And you're hard-headed. And the verse that we use rightfully against perverts is now used against us. And that's the New King James. Because the New King James is not a King James Bible. New American Standard. Unloving. Unloving. New International. Without love. Without love. Sounds like a, sounds like a uh, song, doesn't it? <laughs> now, let me, just, uh, let me just give you a sidebar here. Well, wait. Let's get, uh, let's get Kevin. What's uh, Eng- English Standard say, brother? Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal. Uh, well, well, just give me the first one. Heartless. Heartless? Heartless. Heartless. All right. Now, every version has to have a reason to exist. The, um, the NIV, it, it's known as a, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, not a literal translation. A dynamic equivalency. In the NIV, they said, we didn't translate exactly the way the Greek should be. We translated the way we thought they meant it when they said it. To which I say, how would they know what they meant when they said it? That's what's going on with our Constitution with liberals. Well, the Constitution, the meanings are changed, and so, you know, men can marry men. You really think the guys who wrote the Constitution thought men should marry men? And um, the New New American Standard is known as a literal translation. Very, very sticklers to stay at same with the Greek. Uh, one of the problems, one of the complaints of the New American Standard, not by Bible believers, but by people that used it, is it's very hard to read because it's just very uh, uh, literal. And the, the New King James, uh, when they did theirs, they stole a line from the King James translators. The King James translator said, we just want to take a good translation and make it better. And that's what they said. But here's what I'll tell you. What they really did was they took a good translation, the King James Bible, and made it like the New American Standard. Because, I've studied this, when the, when the New King James translators had a choice, almost nine times out of ten, it will line up with the American Standard, not the NIV. So it's just, it's just another American Standard version. Ah, ah, you say, that's awful. what they tell you? Oh, you think it worse than that? Galatians chapter 5. Now, there is a phrase that is used throughout the Bible. Um, I, I don't know what you say here. Maybe you say the same thing they say down south. Down south, uh, if, if there's a church member and they've been wayward uh, and they put them out of membership, they say, we churched them. That's what they say down south. But what the Bible would say is they are cut off from the congregation of Israel. Um, Male children are supposed to be uh, circumcised on the eighth day after they were born. And it said if a father did not get that child circumcised on the eighth day, that family was cut off from Israel. They were put out. Uh, Numerous times, read your Bible, guys. You need to just read that book and read that book and read that book. Uh, and you'll see time and again, it'll say if a guy does this, he is cut off. Uh, there was the, um, uh, the apothecary, and if anybody, uh, it, the ointment of the apothecary, and if anybody counterfeited that, if somebody made their own version of that, their own uh, ointment, they were cut off from Israel. So cut off simply means if one of you did something wrong and your pastor said, look, we love you, but if you're not going to get this right, 
We can't have you associated with our church anymore, and you are now cut off. You understand that? All right. What's going on here in Galatians is some, uh, some guys are going around uh, and said that Christians could lose their salvation. And the apostle Paul is a little upset with this. And so he makes this statement. He says in verse 12, I would that they were even cut off, which trouble you. He's saying, I wish they were gone. I wish they were cut. I wish you'd put them out of the congregation. Do you guys understand that? How many of you guys had grief? How, how can you possibly understand that? Because you're right. But I understand how you got it. Because watch what the experts do. People that you're intimidated because they've had more college education and you think that they're smarter than you. Let's see how smart. All right, uh, Dan, give me Galatians chapter 5, verse 12 in the good news for modern man. I wish that the people who upset, who are upsetting you would all, I'm sorry. I wish that the people who are upsetting you would go all the way. Let them go on and castrate themselves. Yes, you heard him. Let them go and castrate themselves. That's good news for modern man. I wouldn't want to go to a church where they use that for discipline. Castrate. You, I bet you there wasn't one person in this room when you saw cut off. I wish they were cut off. I bet not one of you said, I bet that means castrate. I'm telling you guys, and, and there's a bigger problem here, and I'll explain it in just a minute. Uh, Living Bible. I only wish these teachers who want you to cut yourselves by being circumcised would cut themselves off from you and leave you alone. All right, cut, cut themselves off and leave you alone. They got it right. They got it right. Living Bible. I wish, they were, I, would, I wish they were cut off. I wish they would get out and leave you alone. Amplified version. Let, let, me, let me ask you this question. Okay? Is there anybody here that really believes when the Apostle Paul wrote Galatians chapter 5, verse 12, and he said those words that he was thinking of castrate? Inspired of the Holy Spirit? Amplified version. I wish those who unsettle and confuse you would go all the way and cut themselves off. All right, now cut themselves off. You know, in light of the first one, that's really, that's really not as clear as I, I would like it, okay? Because you could take that wrong. Uh, New World Translation. I wish the men who are trying to overturn you would get themselves emasculated. Get themselves emasculated. New English. As for these agitators, they had better go the whole way and make eunuchs of themselves. Make eunuchs of themselves. New King James. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Okay, cut themselves off. And again, I'm sorry, that just is not clear, because if somebody misunderstood that, you'd have a real problem. Listen to the American Standard Version. Go ahead, brother. Would that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. That they would mutilate themselves. New International. As for, the, as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Emasculate themselves. English Standard. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Emasculate themselves. Now, here's the double problem. It's not just what they did to the Bible. Let me, let me tell you what I've found. You know, you, you pastor kept saying 47 years, 47 years. I have. I've been preaching 47 years. been dealing with people for 47 years. 
And here's something that I have found in dealing with people. People think that everybody, everybody else is like them. If a person is a liar, they think everybody's a liar. If a person has a problem with lust, they think everybody's lusty. Before I got saved, I was a thief. I, I lock my truck up when we are parked out in the middle of the country on a farm. You say, why? Because I was a thief. My, my big problem here is, where do these men's minds dwell? That when they see cut off, they see castrate, emasculate, make eunuchs, mutilate themselves. Where are their minds that that's the first thing they think of? And that's modern translators. Now, I'm going to put you guys on hold for just a second. Preacher, I want you to come up here because we're going to deal with another version that some of you have been fooled by also. Um, I, I use an old Schofield. Don't come up and tell me everything wrong with it. Okay? Okay, I, I know you're smarter than I am, but I use it anyway. And um, I use an old Schofield. And this one here is a new Schofield. Now, I don't often say things like this, but this book in my hand is a double lie. You say a double lie? This is a double lie. You say, why is that? Well, first off, it says, uh, Holy Bible, Authorized King James Version. All right, is the Bible in my hand a King James Bible? Isn't that what it says on the title page? I got news for you. It's changed every page. They took the word that they didn't like in the King James and put it in the margin and put their own. And every time they did that, I, I got one, I, I marked one. Uh, every time they did that, they, they put KJV in the margin. All right, I'm on page number 104, and the King James Bible has been changed one, two, three, four times on that page. Four times it does not read like a King James Bible, and on the title page it says this is a King James Bible. That's a lie. Uh, on page 105, it's been changed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight times. Four here, eight here, 12. I, I did the math. It actually averages out to four, four times per page. There might be a page where they didn't do it, but you just got eight right there. Oh, wait, I got another place that I had to mark so I could get it right. Um, page 370, King J's Bible has been changed. One, two, three, four five, six, seven times on page 370. 371, it's been changed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Uh, in the New Testament, they have, they have two margins. I imagine that's so they can change it twice as much. Uh, this is page 1274. The King James Bible has been altered one, two, three, four, five, six, six times on that page. Uh, on page 1275, it has been changed one, one time, one time. All right, guys, that's not a King James Bible. But it says on the cover, right on the cover page, it says, it says Holy Bible, that's a lie. It says authorized King James Version. So with the words in the margin, I don't care where it's not in the text. Man. And I don't know about you, but I don't read the margin. I read the text. It also has a second line. It has editor, C.I. Schofield, D.D. You know what that D.D. stands for? Dead doctor. <laughs> C.I. Schofield died in 1921. This was, this was translated in 1967. He was dead for 46 years. How's that for a select resurrection? But it says it's a Schofield Bible, and that's a lie also. Now, here's what I'm going to ask your pastor to do. Take mine, preacher. You got a microphone there? Come on up here. Uh, I want you to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, this just fell open. Honestly, it's just, I had it marked earlier. I, did, I just, it just fell open to uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 23. And in Hades, he lift up his eyes being in torments. There's no hell in the new Schofield. 
That's not a King James. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now we have two ordinances in the Baptist church. We have baptism and the Lord's Supper, correct? All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now here's what, if you've got, a, if you've got any kind of an annotated Bible, generally here's what they'll do. In the text, they'll put a number and a verse. And they're telling you, read, read footnote number, you know, one and two and three. So in talking about the Lord's Supper in chapter 11 and verse 23, it says this. Here's what Paul says. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. All right, now read it again, and I'll stop. Keep reading. It says, uh, for I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Stop. The word that, right in front of the word that, is a one. And that's directing me to read footnote number one. Here's what footnote number one says in a new Schofield. The Lord's Supper is one of two ordinances or sacraments of the church for this age. How many of you, like I was, how many of you, before you got saved, you were Roman Catholic? Okay, isn't a sacrament something that bestows saving grace? Whoever put that note in there believes that taking the Lord's Supper bestows saving grace. Do you guys believe that? No. Baptists don't believe that. Preacher, what does the old Schofield note say for verse 23? He said it says nothing. The reason it says nothing is because that note is not in a Schofield Bible. See, I Schofield wouldn't allow a note like that in his Bible. Ah, but did I tell you? It could always get worse. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. The other ordinance of our church is baptism, is it not? Wait till you see what happens. Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it says this, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. All right, right in front of the word baptized in this new Schofield is a number 2. It's directing me to read number 2, uh, footnote number 2. This is the third paragraph in that footnote. Baptism has, since the apostolic age, been practiced by every major group in the Christian church and in Protestant communion. Guys, if you're not a Protestant, you're a what? Catholic. Whoever wrote this note says, if you're not a Protestant, you're a Christian. And do you notice it didn't say Protestant churches? Because the Roman Catholic Church does not believe that you are a church. They believe you are a bunch of Protestants and you are communing together and need to get back home to Rome. That's why they will never call this a church. You are a bunch of Protestants. That's why it says Protestant communions, not Protestant churches. Because the writer of this was a Roman Catholic. Baptism has since the apostolic age been practiced by every major group in the Christian church and in Protestant communions is recognized as one of two sacraments, the other being the Lord's Supper. So whoever wrote that note believed that baptism fireproofs you. Since early in the church's history, three different modes of baptism have been used. Aspersion, sprinkling, effusion, pouring, and immersion, dipping. And you know what scripture they give for it? None, because there is no scripture for that. You don't find anybody sprinkled. You don't find anybody poured. They got dunked. That whole, that whole thing, brother, is a Roman Catholic note. What does the note say in the old Schofield? There is no note, because that is not a Schofield note, and this book is a double lie. Thank you, preacher. But I just got to show you one more, uh, but I, I won't need to hear on this. Did you know, you probably want to know, there are mistakes in the Bible. Oh, there's no mistakes in the Bible. Well, I don't think so. But then I read my new Schofield and I found out there are. Uh, the note for 2 Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 11. Listen to this. God gave us a Bible free from error in the original manuscripts. Anytime somebody says, do you believe, when you say, do you believe the Bible is the word of God or inspired? If they say in the originals, they don't believe the Bible. That's that coward's faith where they can hide it back there because nobody's ever dug up the originals. Nobody's going to. God gave us a book free from error in the original manuscripts. 
in its preservation through many generations of recopying, he provid providentially kept it from serious error. Now, every time, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how you think. Here's how I think. Serious error. Could you imagine waking up from brain surgery? Hey, Doc, how would it go? Um, well, we didn't. We didn't have any serious errors. <laughs> uh, you will be eating through your right ear now. But <laughs> How would you like to wake up from surgery and have the guy say we didn't make any serious mistakes? Would you go, oh, okay. Wouldn't you like want a list of the minor mistakes? Yeah, well, we couldn't find three pair of scissors, but don't worry, we're charging you for them. Listen, he providentially kept it from serious error, though he, capital H, God, though he permitted a few scribal mistakes. The new Schofield. That, that note does not, is not found in old Schofield. Now, if you've got a new Schofield, here's what I hear. I, I hear this. These are the two reasons people use it. I had, I had a guy tell me one time, I showed him what was wrong with the new Schofield. He goes, but I paid $100 for that. If I don't use it, I got cheated out of $100. How many of you will understand what I'm about to say? If all you ever get cheated out of a year in your life is 100 bucks, you've done well. <laughs> Man, oh, don't you wish? Now, some of you go, oh, $100, that's a lot of money. Are you kidding me? Get married. <laughs> no, really, listen, I, it's got nothing but to do with the wife. Get married. When you get married, there's two things you find out. $100 is not much money, and a year is not much time. And if all, at the end of your life, if you can say, hey, how much money do you get cheated out of in your life? Oh, I think at least $100. You, you've had it good. <coughs> and so I told him, I said, look, if all you ever get cheated out of is in your life is 100 bucks, you did okay. And I get this one. I had guys, grown men. Well, my grandmother got this for me. i got to use it. My question is, what would you do if your grandmother bought you a pink mohair sweater? <laughs> I'll tell you what you'd do. You'd say, Grandma, thank you, thank you. I don't have anything like this, thank God. I have never had a sweater like And you know what you do? You wouldn't throw it away. Your grandmother gave it to you. You'd go to your dresser. You'd pull out the bottom drawer. I mean, way back there. You'd lift everything up. You'd tuck it back there, and it would be there, and they would find it after the rapture. <laughs> and if your grandmother buys you a new Schofield, you go, oh, grandmother, huh, I don't have one of these. And then you know what you do with it? You go home, you open up that bottom dresser drawer, and you put it under the mohair sweater. <laughs> now, New English. I told you, Kev, come here, you put that down. I, I told you that every version has to have a reason to exist. Come on, wherever you are. I don't trust him behind me. All right, the new Schofield, uh, or the new, uh, new English, here's what they say. Here's why you need one. Um, I like this. The New English Bible expresses no denominational or doctrinal viewpoint. That's what we need, a nice non-doctrinal Bible. I think, I think a Kleenex is non-doctrinal, <laughs> and I know what to do with it. Uh, it is not a, uh, a revision of any previous version, but a completely new rendering. Now, I do believe it's a rendering. Uh, but here's what now, 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 guys, here's what I'm saying. When they, they had to have a reason for existing, in other words, when they got done and they read their work, they have some checkpoints, and here's what they're looking for. Uh, and not, it's a completely new rendering, which seeks to achieve clarity, dignity, and in many places, true poetry. So when the New, King, uh, New English Bible translators got done with any portion of Scripture, they read it and they said, is it clear? Does it preserve the dignity of the Word of God? And in many places, is it truly poetic? So here in Judges chapter 1, uh, Caleb has given his daughter uh, and her husband uh, some, uh, some land. And they want, to, they want, do you guys understand land is no good if there's no water on it? They want them a little well. They want them, they want them a spring. And so she pulls up, uh, she comes and rides her donkey up to her dad's and says this in verse 14. It came to pass 
when she came to him, uh, that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted from off her ass. Now, lighted. Let me explain something about your King James Bible. Many words that you think are archaic are not archaic at all. They are presently used in England. Well, you have to remember, this is not only an English language Bible, but this is an England English language Bible. We were over in London a few years ago. We are riding on the, on the, on the, the train, uh, and, and it would say, uh, for those passengers who are lighting at the station. That doesn't mean we got off the train and smoked. <laughs> it means we lighted from off the train. We stepped off the train. I'm sitting in Gatwick Airport, uh, or Heathrow, uh, and it says Flight 428 has alighted. It doesn't mean it caught fire. <laughs> so, so when you, well, that's, that's our kick. No, 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 they say it today. So it says, verse 14, it came to pass, uh, when she came to him, that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? He said, What do you want? Okay. Just the yellow, brother. There's the new, new English version. And she sat on the ass, she broke wind, and Caleb said, What did you mean by that? <laughs> Didn't I, didn't I tell you it can get worse? Yeah, you heard right. As she sat on the ass, she broke wind. And Caleb said, what did you mean by that? I mean, even I knew what she meant by that. Isn't that a guess? You say, could that get worse? Yeah. That's not in there once. That's in there twice. There's a parallel in Joshua chapter 15, verse 17. It's in there twice. I showed that to a preacher. You know what he thought he was going to do? He thought he was going to get on his computer and look at his Bible program and look at the Hebrew word and prove that that was a, moder- a, 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 a legitimate translation. You know what he said? There is no way you can come up with that from the Hebrew. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you, uh, you going to stand in front of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ? Does it ever bother you a little bit about what you're going to answer for? Well, let me take heart. Let me give you some good news. Aren't you glad you will never have to answer for having done that to the Word of God? Aren't you glad you won't have to say, I changed it to this and this and this and this? Guys, I don't know what you got to answer for. You ought to thank God for what you don't have to answer for. You ought to thank God for a pastor. You had a pastor before this one that believed the King James Bible. You have a pastor now, and the whole staff, they don't, they don't just use the King James Bible. Let me explain something. I've heard guys say this. They go, well, my pastor preaches out of the King James, but he studies out of the ESV. And here's what I say. What would you do if your pastor said, oh, I love my wife? Man, I just love my wife. She's just the greatest thing. She's just the most wonderful woman. And then somebody says, oh, by the way, your wife said this. Go, oh, don't listen to her. Don't listen to what she says. She's an idiot. Uh, ask my secretary. My secretary is very smart. And then later they said, well, your wife said this. Well, oh, pff, she doesn't know a thing about that. Man, she's such a blockhead. But my secretary, she is really on top of this. Are you going to believe he really loves his wife? Why would anybody preach out of the King James and then when they're out of sight, put their trust in something else? Right. Now, have you ever heard this? We're about done. Uh, guys, yeah, yeah, open them up to Psalm 23. Have you ever heard this charge? Well, you know, this King James issue is causing an awful lot of division in the cause of Christ. I tell them this. I said, uh, well, yes, but if you think about this, until about 1901 when everybody just used the King James Bible. So, yes, this issue, this new version issue is causing a lot of division in the cause of Christ. I'm glad he's not using us King Jamesers. Here's what these guys are. They walk up to their grandmother who, who read the King James to them when they were on, their, on her knee, when, and, and now she's reading her King James. You know what they do? They walk up their, their, their 80-year-old grandmother, rip the King James out of her hand, stuff an ESV in her hand, and say, read that, Grandma. And when she reads a little bit of it, she goes, this doesn't sound like the Bible. And you say, Grandma, you're causing an awful lot of division. Probably one of the most familiar portions of scripture, even to the lost world, is Psalm 23, correct? 
Now, when they say we are causing division, isn't the opposite of division unity? Okay, here's your pastor right over there. Narrow-minded, hard-headed, probably unkind, <laughs> heartless. Why'd I even come here? Anyway, think about this. If he had his way, he could have 50 people, 5,000 people, 50,000 people, doesn't matter, any, any number you want. If he had his way and said, let's stand and read out of the Bible, wouldn't they all read out the same one? That's unity to me. So here's what we're going to do, guys. You're going to have to get those microphones, share them. And we're going to read Psalm 23 in unison. I'm going to read it from the Bible. These guys are going to read it from these modern translations. Now, guys, make sure you guys crowd around so everybody hears you. Yeah, Caleb, you go ahead and use that one, and then he can share with you. All right, make sure everybody can hear you. Now, here's what I want to ask you guys to do. Read, read loudly. Read clearly. And undoubtedly, one of you will be done, or, or one of you will still be reading when the rest of us are done. And home in bed. Okay, so just finish reading Psalm 23, turn out the lights and go home. But um, let's read Psalm 23 in unison. Now, I, look, in 1995, when I debated the, the uh, head of the New International, uh, New King James, and a guy from the New American Standard, James White was there from, from Arizona, and here's what he said. Well, I just think just get any four translations and read them. That's what he said. He said that like he had good sense. Just get any four translations. You're going to hear what you get. Okay, gentlemen, let's read. The Lord, Lord is, is my shepherd. shepherd. I shall not want. He, 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 he makes me lie down in the grass. He makes me lie down in the grass. He restores my soul. He leads me to the right of the Lord. He leads me to the right of the Lord. He leads me in the past of the Lord. He leads me in the past of the Lord. He leads me in the past of the Lord. He leads me in the past of the Lord. He leads me can you find the amplified version in this picture <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want one word that describes what you just heard. Confusion. Does the Bible not say God is not the author of confusion? Amen. Then God cannot be the author of the multi-version controversy. Now, I love you guys. I have enjoyed talking to you. But let me tell you how much I love you. I love you so much, I would never, I'm done. But I will not let you go with that being the last thing you heard. So, gentlemen, you can put those down and get your real Bibles. And we're going to read Psalm 23 in unison again. And we're going to read it out of the Bible and listen to the difference. It's right after Psalm 22, Caleb. <laughs> Everybody ready? Okay. Let's read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. I rest my case. Thank you, gentlemen. You can take your seats. I, you cannot compare what you just heard to what you heard before it. You ought to thank God you got a church believes King James Bible. Now, I tried to get you out of here early, so it is, uh, 
I've got uh, 24 after 8. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It's, no, it's 28 after 8. Oh, no, no, wait, no, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's 24 after 8. Uh, no, no, it's, it's 28 after 8. You know what the problem is? A man with two watches never really knows what time it is. And a man with two Bibles never really knows what the Word of God says. Preacher. 